Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 256. This week the questions are taken from, from guides 312 and 313, that's HMS Jervis Bay and HMS Renown, the 1895 second class battleship, along with the Wednesday videos on Innovating Victory, that's uh, one of the new books, and when the Japanese came after USS Pennsylvania at the end of the war, with a question or two thrown in from the Friday video on the heavy anti-aircraft Iowa-class designs. So, let's begin. Pilot Mix asks, how did the development of signalling in the Royal Navy go? Signalling in the Royal Navy has a number of different stages, but broadly speaking, if you want to start with, say, Henry VIII's Navy, signals are relatively crude and they'll actually remain that way for a few hundred years uh well at least a couple of hundred years essentially most information at that stage is conveyed either by writing a letter and sending it by a boat um, by getting the people you want to talk to to come over to your ship or just standing at the stern of your ship with a megaphone um not a, obviously a powered one but you know one of the cone-shaped ones and just literally yelling at people. Um, <laughs> there would be a limited repertoire of flag and trumpet signals, very much like if you were on an actual land-based battlefield, but there was no standard set of signals. So at the beginning of a campaign or a major voyage, the captain or admiral, whoever was in charge, would sit there and send out uh, a list to his uh, other ships and say, you know, things like, if I fly a red flag from the mizzenmast, that means this. If you hear three trumpet blasts, that means this. Um, and you could also use cannon salvos um, for that kind of thing as well. But there were a limited number of flags and therefore a limited number of things that you could do and it was all prearranged. So if an unusual situation came up that nobody knew how to deal with, you couldn't actually necessarily tell everybody what was going on. Um, at best, you could improvise. Uh, so perhaps if you saw really rocky shoals ahead or water splashing off of a submerged mount and you know you don't have a signal prearranged for dangerous, unexpected terrain up ahead, uh, then you might do something like... Uh, uh, the signal for all ships to follow the flagship in line and then trust hopefully that your navigation is good enough to steer everybody around it. This basically doesn't really change all that much, as I said, for a while. And then as you get into the 1700s, i.e. the 18th century, you start to see an expansion. First, there's just more flags of different shapes and sizes and colours available, so there's a slightly larger repertoire of things you can say. And then you get the first actual signal code books published where there are preset messages using combinations of flags that are supposed to be universal. And that obviously massively expands what you can do because it's now a universal thing, theoretically, as long as everyone's got a copy of the book, they can learn what various signals mean. And by putting multiple signals in combination with each other, you've exponentially increased the number of different things you can say. That is then further revised to introduce the system essentially as we understand it these days, which in, has a flag designated for each letter of the alphabet, as well as, the, and then as time goes on, they, in, they introduce numbers and some specific meanings for individual flags, as well as spelling things out. And, by the time you get to the Battle of Trafalgar, you've near enough, as makes no difference, got what we would recognise today as the modern system of flag signalling. Obviously, as time then goes on from there until the end of the period the channel covers, they do have to adapt and uh, upgrade the system because you know there are, there will be signals for things like engine trouble or um, various mechanical-related issues which obviously don't apply in 1805 when nobody has an engine at sea. Um, but essentially the, the basic system of flags is the same. It's just some slight meanings are changed. 
uh, combinations have their meanings altered and then of course you can still spell out things anyway if you want. UNSC Forward On To Dawn asks, of the four classes of large surface warships the Kriegsmarine operated during the war, the Deutschlands, Hippers, Scharnhorst and Bismarcks, which class do you think was the most successful in terms of combat-operation performance? I would say, in my mind, the Scharnhorsts are the most successful combat operational performance, you know, cost-benefit ships. Now, if you look at the Bismarcks, well, yes, okay, Bismarck sinks Hood, but Bismarck doesn't even make it back from her first voyage. Tirpitz, the biggest thing you can say for Tirpitz is she ties up a bunch of Allied shipping doing escorts for the Arctic convoys, which, okay, that's that's a certain return on investment. But she literally spends most of her life sitting in fjords and being bombed by the RAF. The Hippers, well, Blucher goes, I'm alive! Hello, Norwegians. Oh, I'm dead. Um, <laughs> Hipper uh, goes out on the same campaign and goes, I'm alive. Glowworm goes, I'd rather change that. Um, doesn't quite manage it, but yeah. Uh, Hipper then goes on to attack a few convoys, shoot up a couple of ships, but doesn't really accomplish all that much in the grand scheme of things, other than being badly beaten up at the Battle of Barents Sea by some six inch light cruisers. Uh, which, considering she outmasses them by almost 60 to 70 percent, is a little bit embarrassing. Then you've got Prince Eugen, whose operational deployment is with Bismarck, splits off to do commerce raiding, promptly breaks down, and has to run for home. And after that, really doesn't do all that much of note. Now, admittedly, in as far as the Eastern Front is concerned, she does then go on to do a bunch of shore bombardment, but that's not really why you build a heavy cruiser. The Deutschlands, Graf Spee, obviously has an initially successful voyage and then gets sunk. Well, she gets badly battered and then sinks herself. To be fair, that's one time the Germans did actually scuttle the ship. Um, Scheer goes out, has a couple of decent anti-shipping co and commerce raiding missions and then gets boxed in. Pretty much the same with Deutschland-Lutzau. They're very, very quickly boxed in because it turns out that the con that sort of the heavy cruiser concept they're based around doesn't really work. Um, then, at least when the Allies have lots and lots of cruisers to throw at you. And then you look at the Scharnhorsts. The Scharnhorsts have Operation Berlin, which is obviously very successful. Uh, they also manage to sink Glorious in the Norwegian campaign. Um, they have a running fight with Renown and they survive. And then they do the Channel Dash, obviously, along with Prince Eugen, fair enough. Um, now, obviously, Gneisen now has a little bit of a run of bad luck, which means she never sees service again. Uh, Scharnhorst goes up north and basically occupies about as much attention as Tirpitz does, whilst costing less and having accomplished more previously. Admittedly, she then does get sunk at the Battle of North Cape, um, but that's... Getting sunk is pretty much the fate of almost every large Kriegsmarine and surface combatant at some point, so um, that's not exactly a massive black mark against. So, yeah, in, in terms of the what the Kriegsmarine got in return for the investment on the ships, I'd say, to my mind at least, the Scharnhorsts are probably the better of the four. Next up, I remember you saying that, in your opinion, the 10-inch guns were inferior to 9.2-inch guns, as they didn't have that much greater hitting power and a much slower reload speed. Given this, why was the 10-inch used on several classes of battleship and armoured cruiser by the Americans, the Chileans and the British, as well as the Italians and Japanese, in the years leading up to the Dreadnought era? It's an unfortunate confluence of factors that results in the 10-inch gun being deployed, some of it is just people going, bigger must be better, but the ships that they want to put these guns on are not large enough to support the 12-inch or 13-inch or 13.5-inch guns that you would find on full-scale battleships, so they have to look for something smaller. And, of course, if they're going to be your biggest ships, i.e. they're going to be your battleship, even if it's what would everyone else would call a second-class battleship, or if you're going to make the latest and greatest in armoured cruisers, then, of course, your gun, while it physically can't be the size of the battleship gun, it still has to be bigger than other people's cruiser-grade guns. So, you know, there, there is a bit of that involved. Another problem is also the 
time that the ships are being designed because you've got to bear in mind that when a ship is laid down its design will have been frozen probably at least six months to a year before the keel is laid and the armament usually is decided even further before that the ship's armament might have been decided on and then ordered two three years before the ship is laid down so even though a lot of these 10 inch arm ships are being laid down in the first half of the 1900s 1900 to 1905 a few of them like renown earlier you're talking about a armament decision that may actually date back to the very very start of the 20th century in 1901-1902 or be a 19th century decision and the reason that's very important is because in the 1890s battleship gun armament was usually measured in uh, minutes per round instead of rounds per minute usually on most of the early pre-dreadnoughts maybe a round every two minutes and if you're really lucky maybe approaching one round a minute um, and that's your maximum rate of fire as opposed to the round per minute average that you get in dreadnoughts and so forth which you know is their average in battle but they can actually fire quicker so you, you've got that for your big guns and then you've got your slightly smaller guns your 8, 7.5, 8, 8.2, 8.3, 9.2, etc., which are found on your armored cruisers as a rule. And they have a rate of fire that's maybe one or two rounds a minute. It's not massively quicker than the battleship guns, maybe twice as fast on average. And if you're then looking at the 10-inch gun, you're probably thinking, well, it's a bit more firepower, and that's especially true for a lot of nations that are got something around about eight inches give or take a fraction uh, the british are a little bit odd in having the 9.2 so you know a roughly two inch increase in caliber seems to make a bit a fair bit of sense in terms of lethality and if your eight inch gun can only do you know one or two rounds a minute then you might think well actually if we're only going to get maybe round and a half a minute out of the 10 inch gun then actually you know that maybe that's not quite so bad a trade-off we're trading off you know half around a minute in exchange for substantially more firepower but compared to an eight inch weapon so there's your logic initially but then over the very last stages of the 1890s and going into the early 1900s you have this complete revolution in the way that guns are made and how quickly they can fire because you're all you've already started to see the improvements from improved powder and propellants which are extending the length of the gun barrel so you go from 30 and 35 caliber to 40 and 45 caliber weapons but then what started out as the quick firing technology of um six inch guns and so forth that permeates up to larger scale weapons armored cruiser guns battleship guns etc although it doesn't obviously make them full quick firing weapons it does suddenly drop their um rpm from you know two one round every two minutes to maybe a theoretical capacity for battleship guns of one to two rounds a minute and smaller weapons like the eight inch and the 9.2 inch jump from a round or two per minute to two to three rounds a minute maybe even three to four rounds a minute but when it comes to the 10 inch gun because of the weight of the shell and the amount of charges that they need unfortunately the 10 inch gun is marginally quicker and in some cases not even that compared to the 12 inch guns so your battleship guns are now around to round and a half minute maybe two rounds a minute at best your 10 inch guns are now about the same round and a half to two rounds a minute but your cruiser grade guns are three four rounds a minute and that's happened over the course of maybe three or four years at which point by the time the 10 inch guns are entering service bearing in mind obviously they're bigger guns they take longer to commission bigger ships take longer to commission as well they enter service at about the time when everything at, when you've got this problem that you know they've got the rate of fire of the battleship gun but not the firepower and they've got not much more firepower than a cruiser gun and the cruiser can fire a lot quicker 
for the most part, it kind of just is down to timing. There are a few outliers, say, like HMS Renown, which is an earlier vessel, when near as much as makes no difference. The rate of fire over 9.2, a 10 inch or a 12 inch is about the same. But that's a very much the exception. The man formerly known as commenting as what I do asks, are there any notable examples in the ironclad period of ironclads that have both a turret or turrets and casements instead of one or the other? Technically, yes, but it's relatively difficult to find them. Um, as you can see here, this is HMS Sans Pari. Um, this is technically speaking, actually also this is a picture of her while when a distant relative of mine was in command of her, but nonetheless, um, technically speaking, she is an ironclad, at least if we are defining ironclads as ships that are armoured where their armour material is not entirely steel, because um, she's obviously got compound armour. Now, in this case, as you can see, she has a single massive twin turret up front, and then she has a series of six inch guns aft, along with her sister ship, Victoria obviously laid out the same. And these technically have what's called a battery screen armour, um, but essentially is effectively a casement deck. So that's an example, but it's rather difficult to find examples in the ironclad period of both of these things existing, simply because when you're talking about iron armour or compound armour, the sheer thickness that you need to achieve to have any meaningful effect relative to the guns that are being fired at you, at least by the time that turreted vessels are becoming the norm, is such that if you have a really, really thick belt, which obviously you need to to keep your ship's hull intact, and you have a very heavily armoured turret, there really isn't the weight left to throw any significant amount of armour onto a secondary gun battery. And a lot of the turreted ships, at least at first in Devastation, Thunderer, Dreadnought, um, various US monitors, etc., a lot of those early turret ships, and even some of the later ones, are just equipped with their main battery. There is no smaller battery. It's only the later ironclads with the advent of torpedo boats that you start to see secondary batteries coming back. And at that point, most of those secondary guns tend to be bow or stern chasers, and they're not, they've not got any armor because the central citadel is amidships. And it's only right towards the end of the ironclad era when they start realizing that you need a fairly significant secondary battery, possibly to engage other capital ships, but also to engage smaller craft. And that with the presence of those fairly large secondary batteries, they might then be knocked out by similar batteries on the other side. Therefore, they need to be armored to get at least against those smaller guns. And hence, you see the development of the casement battery. But this sudden spool of development takes place over the course of maybe a five to ten year period after which the armor technology moves on to steel and you no longer have ironclads by any reasonable measure and then you obviously then continue to have ships with turrets and casements for quite a while. Nick Trains 2234 asks when did the battle line concept emerge during the age of sail? It emerges in fits and starts pretty much from the mid-1500s onwards. At various points, you do see fleets sailing into battle in what you might call a battle line. Um, but equally, at the same time, you see just as many fleets specifically instructing their ships not to do so. And that's because of the nature of gunnery at the time. If you look at the length to breadth ratio of ships of the mid to late 1500s right up until you start to see race built galleons they're pretty stubby and when you look at where their guns are you'll notice they have almost as many heavy guns fore and aft as they do on any given broadside and so again whilst you occasionally see ships going in in a line the usual tactics for gunnery are either just to sail close to whoever you want to uh, shoot at and capture and you give them a broadside or two and then board. So not a lot of manoeuvring is involved there beyond getting closer to the, your target. 
Or if you're engaging them in a gunnery duel, you tend to see ships doing what I've termed the carousel of death, which is they'll sail headlong at an opponent, fire their bow guns, which will usually actually be fairly heavy. Then they'll wheel around and fire whichever broadside they had uh, that, that comes around, whether that be port or starboard. And then they'll continue that wheel around, fire their stern guns, then fire their other um, broadside. And hopefully by the time they've completed that circuit, someone will have reloaded the bow guns and they can fire again. Or they'll just sail off and let somebody else come up and have a go while they reload, depending on how good their gun crews are. And you see a kind of a weird hybrid of this when the English fleet takes on the Armada in that they kind of form a line of battle. It's more like multiple columns, but it's not with the objective of sailing up and going broadside to broadside with the Armada. It's with the objective of sailing in a series of columns at the back of the Armada, at which point the lead ship does its carousel of death, breaks off the next ship and the next ship and the next ship and, the next ship and so forth. Um, and then some uh, some of the battles you end up with whole sections of shipping just wheeling about bombarding the armada and then kind of the the armada period so the 1580s is when things start to change because you start to get race built galleons so these ships have a much greater length to beam ratio they have more guns on their broadside and commensurately proportionally fewer guns um fore and aft and they also tend to have finer sterns and uh bows, which also means they can carry fewer and lighter guns fore and aft than some of their bigger predecessors. And that, of course, then makes them more vulnerable bow and stern, but more dangerous on the broadside, at which point it starts to become more logical to sail in a line of battle, because then each ship physically protects its fellows bow or stern, with the exception, of course, of the ships at either end, and it presents a long wall of firepower. This idea percolates through various navies until you get the Anglo-Dutch wars about 40, 50 years down the line after the Armada. And that's when you start to see it really solidifying from a, this is a new experimental idea, maybe we should try it, to a standard, this is how fleets now fight battles, at least at the start. There will always be um, general chaos sometimes, especially in the early Anglo-Dutch wars, and there will always be people who try and break the line and everything. But the Anglo-Dutch Wars is kind of when the tactic is solidified into the standard tactic. Josh Thomas Moore asks, given their larger size, better construction and historical toughness, could the Shikakus have weathered the damage taken by Soryu and Hiryu at Midway? And would the Japanese have been in a better situation if Soryu and Hiryu were deployed to Coral Sea and the Shikakus were sent to Midway? Well, if you swap Hiryu and Soryu out for Shikaku and Zuikaku at Coral Sea, I mean, obviously there's a question of whether their smaller air groups will be enough to sink Lexington and cripple Yorktown. Um, but let's be generous to the Japanese and assume that they vaguely somehow managed to achieve roughly the same results. The return strike that cripples um, Shikaku historically and means that she's not present for the midway based on the number of hits and their location on Shikaku and transposing that onto Hiryu and Soryu and looking at how they coped with the with hits at Midway, the crude analysis would suggest that whichever one is hit, um, given that Shikaku is the lead ship of her class, so we're going to say Soryu is hit, that would suggest that Soryu would be lost at Coral Sea. Um, then if you now have Shikaku and Zuikaku instead of Hiryu and Soryu at Midway, again, using a relatively crude analysis, when you compare number of bomb hits and locations it, that Shikaku and Zuikaku suffered over the years of their service compared to what hit Hiryu and Soryu, one would surmise that sh the Shikakus would probably survive those hits, uh, or at least they would survive that particular attack whether or not they might be finished off by follow-up attacks is another matter but the individual attacks that sank Hiryu and Soryu would in theory be survivable by Shikaku and Zuikaku and of course they're bringing a greater air group to the party as well so they might do a bit more damage to the US fleet 
But of course, a major component of why the damage is so bad to Hiryu and Saru at Midway is not just that they are smaller, lighter carriers, but also that they have aircraft in their hangars with fuel munitions, etc., etc., which are set off by those bombs. So then the question becomes on the larger carriers, would they have those aircraft beneath their, their hangar or beneath their flight deck in the hangar getting ready for more operations? And if they did, then how many would they have? Would they have been able to launch more aircraft and they have a fewer aircraft in the hangar? And regardless, particularly of the number of aircraft in the hangar, where would those aircraft be? Because obviously on a smaller carrier, you have less space to work with and they therefore aircraft might be crowded into different locations. Whereas if, say, Shikaku and Zuikaku have sent off a lot of their aircraft and they obviously have a bigger hangar space in the first place, then maybe their fully loaded aircraft will be being stored aft, um, ready to be spotted up for the next uh, strike that they're going to launch rather than forward, at which point the then the bomb hits may well be very survivable. Alternatively, if they store their aircraft in roughly the same places that Hiryu and Soryu were, then they have massive hangar fires, which, and you know, as you saw with Akagi and Kaga, probably will doom them. So that there is a chance that the Shikakus would survive midway. There's an equally good chance that they'd go up just the same. Warcats asks. Do you think you could explain the lack of an island on some carriers like Ruggio? There are two main reasons why you might see a carrier without an island. Broadly, one reason applies to early carriers that you see without an island, like Ruggio or Furious, and one or two other carriers who you see later on with islands but have them installed afterwards. Actually, Furious has a small island to put in much later in her career as well. And the second reason applies to much later carriers, um, like some of the conversions that the Japanese end up doing during the, the war. The latter reason is basically size. Um, it, it, they just decide there's not enough room on, there's not enough width on the flight deck to operate aircraft and safely have the island in place. And they can make do with a command position that is below the flight deck, even if it's not necessarily ideal. Um, now, obviously, that logic doesn't apply to everybody who builds small carriers. If you look at the most, pretty much any escort carrier on the Allied side, but it is a certain logic. The logic for the first lot, however, comes down to just how experimental carriers were at the time. And one of the things that had been very quickly appreciated by the very, very earliest experimental carriers, like Furious in her early guises, when she had just a forward flying off deck and then a fore and aft uh, flying off and landing deck, etc., was the creation of turbulence by anything that stuck up above the flight deck. And obviously, turbulence is bad for an aircraft that's trying to land. It's especially bad if you're flying something made of wood canvas and wire, um, which is even more susceptible, perhaps, than a relatively heavy metal aircraft. And so there were a number of things concocted to try and counter this. Uh, people looked at maybe having a tunnel effect created by having islands on either side. Then there was what side do you have an island on? Where does the funnel smoke go? Uh, because obviously the funnel smoke comes with hot air, which creates turbulence as well. And all of this had multiple solutions on multiple different early carriers. But one of the solutions was to just go, well, any island and any amount of funnel smoke venting any distance from the forward part of the ship is going to create turbulence. It's, there may be more or less turbulence, depending on how big it is, what shape it is, where it is, how many of them there are, etc. But it is going to create turbulence. Turbulence is bad. Therefore, if you don't have an island and a funnel, then you don't have the turbulence, which is the best thing for the aircraft, it also maximizes your flight deck operational space, which is quite important on the smaller carriers. And as such, you see a number of aircraft carriers, including Rougeau, which bear in mind is built to try and get under the 10,000 ton limit. She's built, as you can see here, with a bridge that's just on the flight deck right forward, which is the same thing as Furious and a few other carriers. As it turns out, 
for most carriers, this is actually not a particularly brilliant location because it doesn't give you the greatest view of what's going on in terms of ship handling, and it gives you no idea of what's going on in terms of your air group. And so, in the end, an island, usually on the starboard side, is considered to be the way to go. And then, thus, you end up with relatively few carriers having no island. But that's, that was the original logic. And then once you obviously get into having an island, then it's a case of, well, if you have the island further forward, not obviously as far forward as this, but further forward generally, that's better for ship handling, but less good at managing your air group. And an island that's further back is better at managing your air group and less good at handling the ship. And so if you look even at more recent carriers, like say the US supercarriers, if you start with Midway and go through you know, Forrestals, Kitty Hawks, Enterprise, Nimitzes, and the Fords, you'll see the argument as to which is the more important for carrier operation, ship handling or air group. You know, that war going back and forth by looking where is the island along the side of the vessel. And then, of course, most recently you have things like the Queen Elizabeth class where they, um, they've just gone stuff it. We're going to have two separate islands. The one at the front is for the ship handling and the one at the back is for the air group. And now everyone's happy to shut up. <laughs> It's Jimbo asks, I recently watched a documentary, Missions That Changed the War, about the Doolittle Raid. They said the cruiser Nashville expended over 900 rounds in the sinking of the picket ship that spotted the task force. They said the sea conditions were bad, so I was wondering, is this a case of bad sea conditions and a green crew, or is there something else that's missing? Yeah, the poor old picket boat was the Nito Maru, and uh, here's Nashville actually firing at Nito Maru at the time. She was a Brooklyn-class cruiser, which might explain why she was able to fire 900 rounds so quickly. You know, Brooklyn's going full auto on you is not a pleasant sight. However, um, there are a few factors to bear in mind. Firstly, yes, um, Nashville was operating in quite heavy seas, which is obviously going to throw the ship around a fair bit. And bear in mind, this is right at the start of the war. So all the usual stuff that you're used to hearing about in 1943, 44, 45 with radar directed gunfire, etc. is not not happening here. Um, she's relying purely on optical range finding which, of course, is considerably more difficult when the ship's pitching and rolling like it's on a roller coaster. Um, she opens fire at 9,000 to 10,000 yards, which is relatively short range for a cruiser. So you might think that her accuracy should be better than that, and the range war's closing a bit. However, the third factor in all of this was the Nitomaru herself. Whilst she wasn't particularly quick nor particularly agile, she was, of course, trying not to get hit. She was undertaking evasive action. And perhaps more importantly, she was a 90-ton fishing vessel converted into a picket boat. And she was less than 100 foot long total, which meant she was an exceptionally tiny target. So if you think about, uh, you know, even a small destroyer, let's say a Minakaze class, a Minakaze is still over three times as long as the Nito Maru, and obviously considerably wider as well, thus makes a much, much easier target. And that's a small destroyer. For a bigger destroyer like a Fubuki, you're adding another 60 to 100 feet onto that. Um, a Fubuki is about four times the length of poor old little Nito Maru. So you've got a combination of a crew who haven't really seen all that much combat. Nashville is a relatively recently commissioned cruiser who spent the majority of the, what the world generally calls World War II at this point on neutrality, patrol and convoy escort duty. Uh, she's not really been stuck into the action fight against the Japanese all that much. And as we said, she's relying on optical range finding in very heavy seas against a very, very small and maneuvering target. So I suspect if you had, if there were pictures of Nita Maru under fire, which there may be one or two, but you know, if you were looking at it at the time, you would probably see that huge numbers of shells that would have either been direct hits or near misses on something even the size of a destroyer, let alone a cruiser, against something that small are just misses. And that combined with the fact that uh, relatively early on in the engagement they decided they had got the range and just decided to go full auto and didn't check fire for a while would explain the massive expenditure of ammunition because of course if your range is thought to be on target and you go full auto with a Brooklyn 
and then you realize a few minutes later that actually you weren't on target, uh, you can expend an awful lot of shells in those few minutes. Bearing in mind that when you're going full bore with a Brooklyn, you're expending somewhere between 120 and 150 shells per minute, you're only talking about six to seven and a half minutes full auto firing time. Matthew Yang asks, are the Republic and Patri in the game World of Warships actually based off legitimate designs, or are they simply made up conjecturals? So for those of you who are wondering, this is Republic, um, which is the tier 10 battleship in World of Warships, and Patri is the tier 11 dash super ship. Uh, Republic, as you can see here, has two quad turrets with 17 inch guns uh, in as a two eight guns total uh, and Petri essentially is Republic but with an additional super firing quadruple 17 inch on uh, in B turret position. Now in both cases they're essentially made up. Um, Republic has a very mild claim to being at least plausibly based on mishmashing up historical design. So we do know that the French were considering a 431 millimeter gun, a 17 inch gun, just before World War II started. Although it is a little bit weird considering that the French did everything in millimeters and 431 millimeters is, a, is, is not a precise caliber. Um, 430 mil, sure, but 431 to match up with inches? I don't know. Well, it's the French, who knows what they're thinking at the time. In any case, um, so the gun itself at least was something that the French were looking into, even if they never actually you know, built a fully working one. And as that suggests, they never incorporated it into a ship design either. So I think what World of Warships have done with the Republique is they've taken Gascogne, which was a variant on the Richelieu design, Richelieu obviously having two quad 15s forward, Gascogne having one quad 15 forward, one quad 15 aft, then looked at the various designs that were considered for the Alsace project, uh, which ranged from three triple 15s to three quad 15s and three triple 16s. And I think they've then gone, okay, the largest hull that was under consideration on, for that project, not necessarily the one that actually was vaguely agreed for the Alsace, but the largest of the hulls, um, instead of having three triple 16s or um, three quad 15s, how about we put two quad 17s on? So basically taking the Gascogne approach to things. And then as you know, one of those design paradigms might suggest, the one of the Alsace considerations was just take the Richelieu design and add a super, uh, or can they maybe, well, it's either take the Richelieu design and add an aft quad 15 or take the Gascogne design and add a super firing quad 15 up front, whichever way. And for Patri, they've basically done that to Republique and gone, oh, well, if, if the French had built this, how would they want up it? Well, one of the things they might try and do is just slap another quad turret on, which is also how you end up with the Lyon design, essentially, after the Normandies. Uh, so, you know, while there is a certain logic to Patri, assuming Republique had been built, Republique herself is kind of a mashup of two completely separate design concepts that the French were looking at, and so they are both conjectural, but Patrie is more conjectural than Republique. The Rogue Chief asks, what was Jellicoe's own professional and personal opinion on BT both before and after Jutland? And what do we know of his reaction once BT's actions at Jutland became clear? At least from the reading that I've done so far, and to be fair, um, the way when it comes to Jellicoe's autobiography with the Grand Fleet, I've only got an up to the period on Jutland. Um, I haven't actually got beyond that just yet. Jellicoe, even in his own personal writing, at least to me, seems to have been fairly reticent to make any direct comments one way or the other. In part, that may be because of the period he was writing in. Jellicoe always in his professional career at least, seemed to be someone who just wanted things to work. So he wasn't going to unnecessarily stir things up and cause a lot of drama if he didn't think it was absolutely warranted. Now, you could argue with Beatty and the 
continuously disastrous results be brought about, perhaps it was warranted, but Jellico seems to have, at least for the most part, had a slightly different perspective. He only really, you know, stands up and pushes back a little bit when later on after the war, uh, BT and his supporters are trying to blame more and more and more and more things on Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet rather than it sort of basically deflecting off of BT and the battle cruiser fleet. And even then, when you look at Jellicoe's writings, he never, well, not quite never, but very rarely ever directly calls out BT. He will say things like, you know, Contrary to reports that some have said, um, the Grand Fleet actually did this, this, and this, and the Battle Cruiser Fleet did this, this, and this. So he presents the information, the facts as he sees them, and he lets people decide on the basis of that who of the speakers themselves is actually telling the truth. Now, obviously, while he was actively in the Navy, there was also the issue of the command chain to respect, you know, not starting a massive feud between him and his immediate subordinate in the middle of a war but i do get a sense of a certain amount of passive aggression from jellico towards bt uh, when bt's constantly harping on about getting fifth battle squadron jellico only gives in once third battle cruiser squadron is released up to scalper for gunnery training but if you look at some of the exchanges of letters between jellico and bt regarding the matter he He's get he's almost on the verge of being relatively sarcastic, kind of, you know, I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, you're not getting the Queen Elizabeths under most circumstances, and you're certainly not getting them permanently. And in the aftermath, when everyone's trying to figure out why the British battle cruisers have blown up, you have BT sending letters and messages directly to the Admiralty trying to make his case, and Jellicoe just, you know, continues to send his own letters not quite completely in disregard of what BT is sending, but certainly completely independent of what BT is saying, although he does also make some comments um, on BT's communication. And occasionally, you know, where he thinks there's a fair point, he will back BT up. But, yeah, I, I get the sense that Jellicoe probably was rather exasperated with BT a considerable amount of the time, but for the wider good of the service, he didn't want to make a particularly massive issue about it. And by the time he was retired and BT and his uh, cohorts were trying to tear his reputation down, well, at that point, he was just interested in doing enough to keep his reputation above water and not really that interested in getting into an argument. Texas and Lashok asks, how many times has the United States Navy had to justify its very existence? It seems after almost every war, someone comes along saying that not only do we not need a navy that large, but we don't need a navy at all. Unfortunately, the answer to that question, or at least an answer that can be given within about five minutes or so, has to focus quite a lot on politics. <laughs> anyway, uh, what it comes down to, essentially, is that a country like the United States, even from its inception, when it's essentially the 13 colonies under new brand management, is a very, very different country compared to a lot of other countries that would otherwise be major sea powers or have in the past built navies because of other nearby sea powers. For one thing, obviously, the United States at no point in its history has had a major sea power right next to it uh, in the way that perhaps France has. And equally, um, so, well, because of obviously the fact it's a relatively new country, it the United States wasn't in a position for the most part to have a massive age of sail empire like, say, Spain did. But when you look at the reasons of why countries need navies, you begin to get something of a clue of what where the point is going. Spain needed a large navy to maintain a long-distance overseas empire of a fairly large size. Britain needed a navy in large part because once its population had hit beyond a certain size, you needed a navy to keep your economy going and later on even just to keep the population fed. So for a small island nation, having navy is an existential matter. 
Uh, for a large land power like France, if it has imperial ambitions, it means it needs a navy because, well, Spain and at the time the German and Italian states nearby, unless you happen to be called Napoleon, are probably a little bit too much to handle if as a permanent empire. So you want empire, you go overseas. Plus, of course, France, as we said earlier, has major naval powers next to it early on Spain and then later on Britain. So to protect its own interests against possible actions by those powers, it has to have a navy. Whereas the US has Canada and Mexico, and with the greatest respect to the Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy has rarely, if ever, been large enough to trouble the US Navy, and Canada as a whole has never been large enough to, in and of itself, particularly trouble the US. Canada is not an existential threat to the United States, the same way that Mexico is not an existential threat to the United States. Now, of course, they could be annoying, um, especially when Canada is part of the British Empire. The War of 1812 kind of proved that. But it's not going to, at any point, stop the US from being the US. So the existential issue, like with the UK, is out of the question. You then have the political ideals of the US, which for a very long time held that the US should not have an empire, should not have overseas possessions, indeed for quite a lot of the time. Politically, the US didn't even want to get involved in global politics if it could at all avoid it, at least on paper. Um, this was a little bit hypocritical in that almost immediately after the American War of Independence, they went back to demanding the same kind of privileged trade rights that they'd had with the British Empire before they'd broken away from the British Empire, which, of course, is a very geopolitical decision. Um, and they seemed baffled when the British turned around and said, actually, no, we're not going to treat you exactly the same as we did before. But nonetheless, um, at least ideologically, the, the US was fairly isolationist. And, of course, it could afford to be, even as the original 13 colonies and all the way up till now, uh, the USA is one of the very few countries on the planet which is large enough with a diverse enough amount of resources that, technically speaking, as a country, in order to exist, in order to you know have all the essentials, it actually doesn't technically need a navy. You know, the US could trade on whatever terms other people set out, and it's not going to cease existing, economically or nationally. And that meant that when there wasn't a particular threat going around, or at least there wasn't a perceived threat in the short-term view of politicians, they thought, why are we spending all this money on a navy? Especially, again, in the, say, first hundred or so years of the USA's existence, when governments were massively, massively uh, cost and expense averse on a large scale. So you'd have the American War of Independence, there was the Revolutionary Era Navy, or the Continental Navy, and then various presidents decided, you know what, we don't need to get involved in the affairs of lesser nations, so we don't need a navy. And then you had the quasi-war with France, and then you had the Barbary Pirates, and then you had the War of 1812, and then you had the American Civil War. And pretty much as you said, after each of those, well, during each of those, it was suddenly, oh yes, we actually do need a navy to defend our interests. And then immediately after, oh, well, the threat is dealt with. Clearly, there will never be a, such a threat ever again, so we don't need a navy. And it kind of loops like this fairly persistently. And right towards the end of the period that the, the channel covers, you also obviously have this whole argument of, oh, well, everyone's going to use nukes in a future war. So if the Air Force is going to drop the nukes, then who needs the navy, which is the origin of the supercarrier to support nuclear capable bombers, amongst other things, plus, of course, eventually just beyond the channel's reach, the nuclear ballistic missile submarine, and be slightly before that, the nuclear guided missile carrying submarine. But using a very broad brush, you could essentially say that the US Navy stopped having to justify its existence per se when the US decided that it too was going to start playing the Imperial game, which is how it ended up with things like the Philippines and Samoa and various other long distance overseas possessions, essentially picking up bits and pieces that the European nations hadn't quite got round to, or in the case of the Philippines, taking them off a European nation. Combined with that kind of snowballing dash being a constructive feedback loop with the fact that the US had decided that it didn't want to just be a relatively large nation amongst other nations. 
it was beginning to claw gradually for a position at the top table. And if it wanted to be at the top table, then it had to have a big stick to wave around at the other nations at the top table. And that meant having a navy because whilst the Atlantic and Pacific isolate the US from pretty much anyone who might be a peer opponent, it also means if the US wants to be a peer opponent to anyone else, they have to go over there, which means, again, they need shipping. Bill Ridout asks, Drac, could you briefly explain how landing ship tanks, LSTs, made the trip across the Pacific Ocean? So this is similar to the question last week, but specifically looking at LCT, oh, sorry, LSTs, and the difference between an LST as opposed to an LCT. And a landing craft tank would need a fair bit of work to make it across the Pacific, but it, it could be done. You'd probably want to tow the thing, though. Um, whereas an LST, a landing ship tank, well, depending on which make and model of LST you're looking at, they can vary between the weight of a large destroyer all the way up to the displacement of a small cruiser. And of course, physically, they are larger than those vessels for the most part because they don't have armor, they don't have massive numbers of guns stuck on them. And of course, there's a big hollow space inside, which is where the tanks live, as you can see here. And as a result, because of therefore their size and displacement, they are entirely capable of motoring along around the Pacific on their own. Um, obviously, you don't send them completely on their own, you send them in convoys, but the LSTs going around the Pacific Ocean would just sail themselves. Uh, they didn't need any particularly special provisions other than obviously sailing in convoy with escort for protection, but typically you would stage up to Pearl Harbor. There was a huge collection of them in that in the in Hawaii. And then you would stage pretty much as any other US Navy vessel would stage down through a series of islands, island bases until you got near the front line. And some of them would sail with the equipment there and then from continental United States or wherever they were, else they were coming from. Others would sail with supplies, others would sail relatively empty, and then the ones that had supplies or could sail empty could pick up tanks and men closer to the front lines where they might have been delivered by transport cargo vessels that are completely unsuited for full front line operations. Richard Hsu asks, during World War II, did sonar and radar systems mounted on ships show their data on a small monitor or was it audio only? And if it was shown on a monitor, how was this monitor constructed? How did the display work? And how did it display data from the sonar and or radar? Sonar and radar in World War II always had some kind of display. Now, what that display was could be different. Uh, towards the end of the war, and depending on the ship, towards even the middle part of the war, there were the PPI indicators, or plot position indicators, point position indicators, depends on which book you read, which exact and that, uh, thing that stands for. But in any case, the familiar circular screen where your ship is in the middle and everything goes ping or blip or whatever interesting sound you want effect you want to put into it, and it shows up little blips and you can go, aha, this is not one of ours, therefore we shall go and blow it up. But in the early stages, you had for radar what essentially looked like an oscilloscope screen. Uh, by the way, this is the Aztec room aboard HMAS Diamandina, for those interested. Um, but anyway, early wall radar, oscilloscope screen, and essentially how far along the oscilloscope screen the return was, gave you the distance. And then you would look at the size of the spike, which would determine either the size of the aircraft or the number of the aircraft more often. And then the direction of the beam, which you would know from the equipment, would then you could then via triangulation work out what altitude those aircraft were at. Whereas with ASDIC, initially it was a lot like trying to aim a searchlight into the dark. So if you look at early ASDIC screens, um, they basically look like a small portion of a disc visible through a rectangular screen with a little arrow pointing along it. And that's because that disc represents the direction that the ASDIC transmitter is pointing in around the ship. Uh, however big of an arc your ASDIC is, obviously early ASDIC is pointing forward 
only with a relatively limited traverse and you send out the ping and when the um, ping returns that flashes up as a signal on your screen and depending on how far up that screen it is obviously if it's right close to the bottom then it's very close if it's right up the top it's far away and then obviously the size of the flash of the light will also tell you roughly how big that contact is at that range and then you look at your dial and you go oh, okay well that was a very large contact at a thousand yards and it's on bearing 275 or something like that and then you'd go and try and find things now obviously the weakness of that was that if you were trying to locate a submarine and you were looking in one direction and the submarine happened to be in the other direction you weren't going to see anything um, which along with the improvement in systems generally is one of the reasons why ppi indicators are so much more useful but that's the generic evolution of the displays for those two systems during the war rebel Skvirl asks do various battleships main guns sound noticeably different from each other based on their caliber and size of charge there would be a noticeable difference in power depending on caliber bearing in mind a typical 12 inch gun has a charge that's about half the weight of the charge that would be used in a typical 16 inch gun so you know, twice the amount of explosive twice the boom at a given distance that is reasonably safe you are going to notice quite a difference albeit if you are standing relatively close to the gun when it goes off a difference in its noise is going to be somewhat academic um now obviously that is related to the caliber so caliber and size of charge kind of go hand in hand um admittedly there will be within specific calibers say between a 45 and a 50 caliber gun there might be a slight difference in the amount of powder that you use or whatever other form of propulsion you're using but it's going to be a marginal difference uh to be honest it's more about the just the the overall caliber rather than the length of the barrel um now as for other differences in sound now of course everybody uses slightly different propulsive components so you know cordite poudre b etc etc they will have slightly different explosive properties so there will be a again a slight difference in overall tone to the explosion but broadly speaking to the untrained ear or indeed the ear that has not yet been deafened by listening to substantial numbers of battleships giving broadside there usually won't be a huge difference mostly because of the just sheer overwhelming noise of it um but if you were to examine things acoustically then yes different sized guns and different guns firing with different propellant types of propellant from different nations would have a slightly different acoustic signature a lot of what you've got to bear in mind when it comes to listening to actual recordings of battleship gunfire as opposed to simulated sounds of battleship gunfire that have been overlaid is that most of the time the overlaid sounds are a lot more complex and a lot longer lasting than actual battleship gunfire like you said more more of a bang than a boom in fact when you look at accounts of people who served aboard ships they often talk about salvos crashing out because to a certain extent the noise is so apocalyptic it just sounds like a massive crash and then it's over a good chunk of that is because a lot of the sounds are sampled and then overlaid onto battleship gunfire in movies and silent footage that's been overdubbed tended to be of artillery pieces on land and even if they managed to find an artillery piece usually actually ironically enough an ex-naval piece that is of the same caliber or close to the acoustic environment is very very different usually at sea if you fire your guns there's going to be some reflection of noise off the water but of course as you can see here there's nothing else to reflect the noise back at you unless you've got really 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 high seas at which point you'll hear the initial crash of the gun and not a lot thereafter whereas if you're firing artillery on land very very rarely are you firing artillery on land that is flat horizon to horizon so you are going to get a series of reverberations and echoes back off of hills and slopes and rocks and buildings and so forth 
Um, plus, of course, soil and rock itself has a different consistency and acoustic re reflectivity as compared to water. And so artillery on land, you tend to get a slightly more rolling boom going on. Um, it, it's essentially in some, in some ways, not entirely, but in some ways just echoes lap, overlapping on top of each other. Um, it, and it's the same thing, you know, if you burst a inflated balloon, just a party balloon, if you pop that outside, there's a bang. If you pop that inside, it can often be a lot worse. Like pop it in a sports hall and it sounds a lot louder and actually sounds like it lasts longer because, again, of the reverberations. And then you take it into an acoustic chamber and it's just pop. Because, again, the sound is you're just hearing the sound of the initial uh, balloon failure, not all the reverberations and echoes of it bouncing off the surroundings. Now, of course, that does mean one critical thing, which is that the sound of a battleship's gun firing can change depending on where the battleship is. I mean, it can, in theory, even change based on atmospheric conditions, how dense the air is, how moist the air is, what layers there are in the air, in the atmosphere. But more specifically, if you are a battleship fighting out at sea, the guns will sound one way. If you're a battleship fighting uh, close to land, are you're doing maybe shore bombardment fire support, you will actually get reflections of the gun fire coming off of some of the nearby land features, which will slightly change the audio profile of the gun, even if it's exactly the same gun. And of course, if you fire it in very enclosed environments, you will get an entirely different effect again, hence the slightly demoralizing effect of war spikes guns going off in the Battle of Narvik, or the Third Battle of Narvik, when you have the sounds of not just the gun, but the sounds of the shells as well flying down the fjord, reflecting multiple times back and forth off what's for ships, at least a very, very, very confined environment with a lot of very reflective rock surfaces at different angles. And finally for this week, Vinve asks, during the period the channel covers, was minimizing the number of the crew ever a priority in warship design? Yes, it was actually as long as there were organized navies, minimizing the crew requirements was actually a perennial challenge for various <laughs> navies, depending on what area you're looking at, basically because people cost money. Um, and if you're going to spend things, if you spend a lot, a lot on a ship, that's a big upfront cost. Now, yes, you do have the maintenance costs and requirements going forward, but if you look at any organizational structure, whether it be your generic office-based environment, um, more active out in the field environment, or naval warships, you'll find that staff crewing costs are a huge portion of your overall budget. And therefore, Obviously, if you can find a way to have a ship that is just as effective but require less crew, that is a good thing, and you will try and accomplish that. Now, back in the old days when it was mostly that the ship systems would be run entirely by hand, there was not a huge amount that you could do to actually reduce the ship's crew size without compromising the ship's fighting capability. But even then, there were arguments, you know, along the lines of, well, take a, a third-rate ship of the line, for instance. In the early part of the 1700s, the, a third-rate could be a 50-gun ship, a 60-gun ship, a 70-gun ship, or an 80-gun ship, um, certainly in some of the later establishments, or any number of guns along that line. Now, if you looked at the crew requirements for a 70-gun or an 80-gun ship, you could say, okay, well, this is a much more powerful vessel, but it can only be in one place at once and requires a lot of crew. Whereas a 50-gun ship, because you have, compared to, say, a 70-gunner, you have 20 less guns, so you have 20 less gun crew, and it's a smaller ship overall, so you need fewer men to manage the sails in theory, and, fewer me and with fewer men to feed, you need fewer galley staff, etc., etc. It all leads on. Um, fewer midshipmen, because you've got fewer units of men to command. Therefore, having a 50-gun ship is more economical than having a 70-gun ship, and if the ship costs 
less as well. Then maybe we can have two 750 gun ships and then we can have two ships in two different places instead of a more expensive 70 gun vessel which can only be in one place. And various arguments to that effect pop up quite often throughout naval history and even today. Of course, you do have to contend with the fact that, yes, you might have two 50-gun ships in two separate locations, but they are only 50-gun ships, so if someone builds a 70-gun ship and shows up, you are in a bit of trouble. But that's a separate argument. But when you look at, say, uh, the great ships, even before the classic Age of Sail, a lot of them had four masts. Now, eliminating that fourth mast and settling in on a three-mast design does have a number of other advantages in terms of sail power, etc., but one of the big advantages is that three sets of uh, well, three sails with three set sorry, not three sails three masts with three sets of sails, especially if they are considerably larger sails, means that although you need more men per sail, because you might only be hoisting two or three sails on each mast, your overall crew requirements go down as compared to having four masts and four sets of sails. So that re reduces your crew. Of course, as automation comes in or becomes possible in the latter part of the 19th century, as you begin to get steam power and then electrical power introduced on ships, then more and more stuff is invested in reducing crew requirements. So you know, if you have a powered hoist for the shells, then you need people to move the shells into the hoist at the bottom and people to remove the shells at the top. But you don't necessarily need a large gang of people in charge of hoisting the shells. You might have a backup system that can do that, but you don't need a dedicated group of people to hoist shells around. Um, one of the big advantages, well, one of the many big advantages of switching from coal to oil is that you don't need a dedicated load of men to physically move the coal from the bunkers to the boilers, because that's all done by, again, by automatic systems, which can be regulated by very much fewer men. One of the secondary, not primary, but secondary reasons that the British stayed with lower pressure boilers compared to American higher pressure boilers in the period of World War II was because lower pressure systems needed fewer crew to look after and maintain them compared to higher pressure systems, which of course then cut down on the size of the crew, which cut down on the cost of both the crew themselves and the cost of the ships, because if you your engineering crew, let's say, arbitrarily numbers 350, you have to accommodate 350 crewmen for your engineering section. Whereas if your crew is, say, 550, well, all of a sudden that means a lot more space has to be taken up for the crew aboard the ship, which means the ship has to be larger. Or in the year of treaty requirements, you have to sacrifice other portions of the ship uh, to accommodate your crew, or you have to pack your crew in really, really tight, which may impact on morale. So keeping the number of crew down to a reasonable minimum is a problem that navies have been wrestling with almost all the time, but much more so following, say, about 1850, 1860, once the advent of power and thus mechanical systems has more easily allowed for the replacement of people with either wholesale mechanical systems replacing them or mechanical systems doing most of the work and leaving only a few to monitor those systems. And that brings us to the end of the dry dock for this week. Uh, next week is, of course, the Patreon dry dock once again, so look forward to another many hours of questions and answers. But for now, thank you very much for listening and hope to see you again in another video sometime soon. Bye.